All right, well, it's good to be here with you again to go to Revelation chapter 6. We're studying the book of Revelation, and this is what you've been waiting for, right? This is it, the four horses of the apocalypse. That's what most people think of when they think of the book of Revelation. They think of the four horses of the apocalypse. So we're going to get into that today. Let's remember what we've been going through. Chapter 1 was kind of an introduction, Jesus telling you who He is and how um, John saw a vision. Chapter 2 and chapter 3 were down here on earth, the churches. Chapter 4 was what? Heaven is opened, like a door in heaven. So that sounds like the rapture to me. Now a lot of people say, well the book of Revelation is not in chronological order. Well it has been so far. And as we go along, it's pretty much in chronological order, but then we see a retelling of the same thing over and over and over several times. But in chapter 4 and chapter 5, we see He's up in heaven. So in chapter 6, is this in heaven? Well, this is Him in heaven looking down on earth. So this is some things that are going to take place here on earth, but while He's up there in heaven looking down. So we got to remember that. And we got to figure out who these four horsemen are. And I'll tell you, uh, they're a type of something. Are they literal angels? Are they literal devils? I don't, I don't know. The more I read the book of Revelation, the more questions I have. But we're going to look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse today, also the seven seals. But only six of the seven seals are given in this chapter, which is weird because the seventh seal isn't open until chapter 8. So we've we got to go through chapter 7 before we can see what happens with the seventh seal in chapter 8. So chapter 6 is something happening in heaven, which leads to events happening on earth. Because a seal is opened up there, something is allowed to take place down here. Almost like the Lord is protecting us from certain things. I believe He protects us every day. Amen? Amen. And we need to seek His protection. Can things in heaven affect things on earth? Can things on earth affect things in heaven? Let's go to Matthew chapter 16 real quick. That was a thought that I had as I was reading through here. And sure enough, Jesus said this to uh, one of the apostles. Now, I don't think this is in effect to today, <laughs> like the Catholic Church believes. But it is interesting how Matthew chapter 16, verse 17 through 19 says, Matthew 16, 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, the Catholic Church says Peter is the rock. They must not have read the rest of the Bible. The rock is Jesus. So he's saying, you're Peter, but upon me, this rock, Jesus is speaking, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What is that? That's millennial kingdom. And... Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he goes on there. So that's interesting. Now turn over to 18, 18. Chapter 18 and verse 18. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What an odd thing how God gave that power to them. Now is that for today? Well, if that is for today, there's a guy that's called the Pope who believes... I can do that. All right, Mr. Pope, if you're watching, do me a favor. Make a declaration to the whole world that everyone's sins are forgiven and everyone goes to heaven. Okay? You'll be the most popular person on earth. But you won't do it, will you? Because there's no money in that, is there? That's what's so sad. Religion is all about money. You've got to pay for the Mass. But uh, the truth is, it's Jesus that forgives us our sin and takes us to heaven, not some man. Amen? But that is an interesting passage to see that Jesus said to His disciples, you can do this, something down here can make it happen up there, and vice versa. Well, here we are in Revelation chapter 6, and we're seeing something taking place up there that affects down here. I just, I don't know what to do with that, except that's interesting. That's very interesting. So, a lot of things down here are representations of things that are up there, and vice versa. Now, we've already seen that in the churches, haven't we? And how the churches are types of things. So, I don't get into all of that, but I just find that interesting. Now, this is to the early apostles. Again, could they be the 24 elders? Maybe not. But then again, maybe so. But uh, could it be that the elders are, up, are somehow having to do with these seals? I don't know. Look at Revelation chapter 5 though. 
It doesn't look like it because remember Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Here's your seven seals we're going to see today. And it goes through there. What does it say? Who is worthy to open the book? Verse 3, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much. So it's not those apostles loosing something in heaven, is it? It's Jesus. And you go through and it says that Jesus is the one. You read that in, uh, I believe it's verse 7. And He came and took the book out of the right hand of Him that sat upon the throne. And so who is loosening these seals? Who's opening it up? Jesus. So Jesus is the one opening these seals. So without further ado, let's go to Revelation chapter 6. Let's start reading about this. And there's a lot to get into. And uh, I want to go through this as quickly as I can. I would love to go more in detail in the book of Revelation. But I figure, well, I just, I'm going to give you just a general overview of it would be the best thing. Because we could get so deep into this thing, we'd never get done. <laughs> there's so many different interpretations of so many different people. Which one's the right one? Well, you have to go by the Holy Spirit leading you. And you have to go with Scripture. So whenever I read the book of Revelation, I try not to take what some man says in a commentary. I think to myself, well, it says this here. Where does it say that in the Bible? And I always look over and see. And you know what? A lot of stuff in the book of Revelation is in Daniel, or it's in Isaiah, or it's in Ezekiel, or it's in someplace else. And I, I found some really cool stuff as I was studying this. So Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder... One of the four beasts saying, come and see. All right, so the first seal is opened, and there's the noise of thunder. Now where? On earth or in heaven? Well, this is taking place in heaven. Now look down there at what's happening on the earth. So there must have been the noise of thunder in heaven. Now, it says one of the four beasts. Do you remember when we looked at the four beasts and how they're the four archangels? So which one of these beasts could it have been? Was it Michael? Was it Gabriel? In the Old Testament, Daniel, I'll just give you the verses on this. But uh, in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10, verse 13 and verse 21. Also, Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, Michael appears to Daniel and speaks to Daniel. Is that amazing or is that amazing? I think he's called the prince. He's a prince of Israel for, for some way. As we get to Revelation 12, we'll see that too, how he fights in heaven. So, Michael appeared to Daniel. Could Michael have appeared to John in the book of Revelation? It's so neat how everything in the Old Testament somehow lines up with the New Testament. Uh, or could it have been Gabriel? Gabriel shows up in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 16. Did you know that? Gabriel and Michael appeared to Daniel, and he talked to both of them. That's, that's, I didn't know that until I studied this out. I said, oh, wow, he talked to both of them. I never thought of that. Luke chapter 1, verse 19 and verse 26, it was Gabriel who showed up and says that Jesus will be born of a virgin. So is he seeing one of these four beasts? I don't know. Which one was it? He doesn't say. It's not that specific. So that just makes my mind just go, which one was it? I just want to know more. You know, that's going to be one of my questions when I get to heaven. I'll be like, which one of you showed up to John <laughs> and told him this stuff about the seals? But actually, it's all four of them as we read through chapter six. And that's what's amazing. Now, some people, when they look at this and we read through here, we see that the four beasts or the cherubims, each one of them shows up with each seal. The question is, in what order do they show up? Because if you look at the order, and we don't have to go back to the beginning of, of chapter, I think it's four, but if you go back to chapter four, it tells you that the four beasts were the first one was what? Do you remember what the first beast was? A lion. The second one was a calf. The third one had the face of a man, and the fourth one was an eagle. So some people, when they go through here, they say, well, they kept that order. So the first beast is the lion. So this is the lion showing up. And I don't know. It doesn't say that either. It's just amazing to me as I'm studying this just to see how sometimes we have our preconceived ideas. Well, it had to be in this order, but it doesn't say. So it could have been any one of these. But just for sake of remembering, uh, let's say this was maybe the first beast mentioned in the other chapter. Maybe this is the one that was the lion. So he says, come and see. And he saw something. What did he see? Verse 2. Now, this will lead us to the four horsemen, so let's do this. Let's look at the four horsemen. And I am not a good artist, so I didn't draw that. I traced it, okay? But I did my best. These are the four horsemen. And we're going to look at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I believe that this is after the rapture because of what we're seeing so far and what we've seen. I don't believe it's today. 
But a lot of people will say, well, no, like you said, Mr. Breaker, a triple application of the book of Revelation, I think this could be uh, the last 2,000 years. Uh, and some people make that argument. All throughout the last 2,000 years, there's been war, there's been famine, there's been death, there's been... So some people look at this and again try to make it past. Other people look at it and say, well, maybe there could be a double application. Maybe this could represent things that happened throughout history. But as I'm reading this, I'm seeing that this has to be after the rapture. Because the first person that shows up is this guy. And this guy has to be the Antichrist. He just looks like he's got to be the Antichrist. Okay? So that's what I see. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 6 in verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Now, come and see. Come and see. That's German. Come and see. If you have a new version of the Bible, a lot of times they'll leave out and see. It just says, Come. So what is he saying? Come with me down to earth? <laughs> so he just left heaven and came down here? No, come and see. So come over here and look. And they're looking down on why would you take out and see? You're going to see here in a minute, and if I forget to mention it, uh, it's weird if you take out the and see, it almost makes it look like he's coming to the Antichrist instead of coming. Uh, I, don't, I don't like versions of the Bible that leave words out. Okay, so if the Bible says come and see, come and see. Okay, so he says come and see. Now verse 2, And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And I forgot to put a crown up here on this guy, my bad. So he had a crown on, and he went forth to conquer, a conquering and to conquer. So this is conquest. This is some person that takes over through conquest in the world and becomes all powerful. Now who could this be? Well, if you go to most so-called cemeteries, oh, excuse me, what is that? Oh, seminaries, excuse me, Bible seminaries in the world, uh, you go to a lot of these so-called commentaries of people that claim to be Christians, you know what they say? They say, why, this is Jesus Christ. And I'm like, Jesus Christ goes around with a bow? Wow, I'm, I like bow hunting, so I like Jesus even more. But where in the Bible does it say that this is Jesus? He's the lamb. It doesn't say he's riding this horse. There's another passage where Jesus is riding a horse, and he doesn't have a bow, and he doesn't have a crown. He has many crowns. So a lot of people are Bible blockheads, I hate to say it, when they come to this passage and try to make this Jesus Christ. Now, why do they try to make this Jesus Christ? Because, again, their application is, well, this is throughout the last 2,000 years, and so Jesus is conquering the world. How is he doing that? Well, the Catholic Church says, literally, <laughs> The Crusades, remember how they would use war to try to conquer the earth for their religion? I don't believe in that. I don't believe Jesus wants us to use violence, right? We're supposed to preach the gospel. So I do not agree with this idea that this is Jesus. So who could this be? Well, let's turn over to Revelation chapter 19. Again, many claim that this is Jesus in the passage because he's on a white horse. Uh, no, no. It can't be, because Jesus, when He shows up on a white horse, there's some differences. Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. And I saw heaven opened. So here He's coming down on a white horse, Jesus is. Remember, back in what we just read, there's some guy on earth on a white horse. So that's not Jesus, because Jesus is still up in heaven. So this is Jesus on the white horse. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as the flame of fire, and on his head were what? Many, many crowns. crowns. So that's different. This guy over here has one crown. Jesus has many crowns. So who could this guy be? Do you realize the Antichrist or Satan imitates everything that Jesus does? So this is an imitation of Jesus by Satan. And we're supposed to watch out for that. And it says, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, capital W. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who would that be? Us who are saved. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. When will that be? The thousand-year millennial kingdom. And he treadeth the winepress in fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So this is Armageddon. So this is the beginning of the tribulation. Jesus comes back on a white horse at the end. So this cannot be Jesus Christ. 
how anyone could say that. Now, there was a church here in Pensacola called Brownsville. Uh, we've called it Clownsville. <laughs> you remember Brownsville? Oh, it's a revival in Pensacola. You go, oh, great, a revival. And you look at the crime statistics, no crime went down whatsoever. A real revival, crime goes down. <laughs> and it's called a Pentecostal church. And uh, this guy named Kilpatrick believed that they did the Toronto outpouring and all this stuff. And you go to that church, and there was a, a singer of that church who was the, the song leader, and he wrote a song. And his song was, Yes, Lord, we will ride with you. Have you ever heard that song? And in that song, he says, We're going to ride with the one that's riding the white horse with the crown. Not me. <laughs> I'm going to be riding with the one with the white horse with many crowns, which is Jesus Christ. They literally in that song did not know their Bible, and they're, they're singing about riding with the Antichrist. That's why doctrine matters, amen? <laughs> so when we get into this book, we need to know, hey, this guy, the first one that comes is the bad one. It's the second one. You know that's all through the Bible? It's not the first one, it's the second one. It, it wasn't uh, Cain, it was Abel. Uh, it wasn't uh, Ishmael, it was Isaac. It wasn't uh, Esau, it was Jacob. It, all through the Bible, it seems like the second one is the right one. The first one is the one that's not. So first comes the Antichrist, then comes the true Christ, Jesus Christ. Okay? So, yes, sir? The, the bow that he's carrying, is it not the bow that's in Genesis chapter 9? Well, see, that you're getting ahead of me, but I'm, you, I totally forgot that in my notes. And I said, Lord, please let me not forget that. So thank you for saying that, too. Guess what? Here comes the Antichrist. Okay? He comes with a bow. Well, there's a thing in the world today called a rainbow. <laughs> so could he come with the rainbow and be all about, hey, look at me, you know? Well, then that would, that would kind of make sense because we're seeing a big push for the rainbow and things like that. Now, if you know your Bible, the Bible says that the Antichrist has not the love of women. So that would be like, hmm, so coming with the rainbow. Now, there's another possibility. He comes with a bow. Notice it doesn't say arrows. He just has a bow. If you'll look at the handout that I gave you, there's a man in Rome called the Pope who claims to be Jesus Christ. <gasps> How dare you say he's... No, he claims to be the vicar of Christ. That means in place of Christ. He literally says, I'm here in place of Jesus. That's what they believe. He carries this cross, which is a bent cross. Have you ever seen that cross that the Pope has? It looks like a cross, but it's bent. And whoever sculpted that thing has Jesus hanging like this. And when you put that thing sideways like I did down below, doesn't that almost look like a bow? Yeah. Isn't that weird? So when I look at that thing, I go, man, that's pretty creepy. <laughs> that's pretty strange. Um, for many, many years, most of the Protestants called the Pope the Antichrist. Did you know that? Now, when you're shooting a bow, you go like this with two fingers and you pull it back. You know that? Now, nowadays they have a little trigger for you, but you use two fingers. What's the papal blessing? Two fingers. Is there something to that? Is that pointing us to danger, Will Robinson? Danger, watch out for, you know, a certain church in a certain place. Well, as we get in the book of Revelation, we get to uh, Revelation chapter 17, and there's a, a church mentioned on seven hills who is not the true church. So I just want to throw that out because, wow, the bow. And you look at, makes me think of that kind of bow, makes me think of that thing that that guy carries that looks like a bow, makes me think of a bowman, that's called a bowman's fingers. And it, there's a lot of weird to it. Have you ever seen statues in the Vatican of the popes? And they're like this. They're showing those two fingers. What is that all about? Is that part of the warning in this that we're reading? Is there anything to that? So I just want to make sure we, we look at that. So Jesus Christ is not this. But many churches try to say, well, spiritually that's Jesus because spiritually Jesus is conquering the world. We must not be doing a very good job because there are not a lot of Christians in the world, at least not a lot of true ones. So no, that can't be Jesus. That must be the Antichrist. And that's what I see. He's the imitator. So the first rider on the horse is the coming of the Antichrist. And he conquers. Now how does he conquer in conquest? There's two ways, either in war and maybe that happens. A lot of people believe that a war is going to take place during the tribulation at the beginning um, or perhaps right before the rapture. But there's going to be a war because when he comes in, he'll be the guy that stops it. And that's peace, peace, peace. Right. So the man of peace. But how does he come? Well, you can come in war and win or you can come politically through political means. 
We saw a man who they claimed was the president of the United States of America who came in, never did anything his whole life, and they gave him the Nobel Peace Prize. And then he goes and bombs people in this place, and he bombs people over here. And it, 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 so I see there's two different ways that a person could come in through battle or through political means. So it'll be interesting to see which one. Now, uh, interestingly enough, look at the three colors of the four horsemen. White, red, black, and green. Now here on your paper that I gave you, do you know that's the four main colors of Islamic nations and Islamic flags? I went to Wikipedia and it says, yeah, most Islamic flags, these are the four colors they use because Muhammad did this or something. It's just weird how all four of these just happen to correspond with the four main colors of the flags of Islam. So some people look at this and they think, well, we think in the last days militant Islam will rise and they'll go and conquest. You see, it's all about the Middle East in the Bible. And over there, um, you know, America is like an afterthought in the Bible. People say, where's that in the Bible? Well, I think it's probably there as an eagle or something like that, because that's what we have on our uh, seals and everything is eagles. But it's interesting that militant Islam wants to take over the world. Isn't that something? And how it identifies these four colors. The more you think about the book of Revelation, the more you go, hmm, it's ahead of its time, this book, isn't it? So let's go back to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 2. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So he had a bow, but a crown was given to him. For some reason the world crowns him as the head. My thought has always been he'll be the head of the United Nations. And the head of the United Nations will be the Antichrist. I'm not thinking in my mind that the Pope is the Antichrist. I think the Pope's probably going to be the false prophet. Because I think a political world leader would have to fill this here. But I could be wrong. Could be the Pope. Pope, Pope could be. And the whole world worships the Pope. But that, a lot of people in the world don't like the Pope. And so I don't see how the Pope himself could be the one world leader. But it's one of those things. Now, verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, all right, now if, if it's the four in line, then the first seal, the beast was the lion. This one would be the um, second one, which would be the what? The um, calf, all right, if it's in order, okay? But it says here, and when he had opened the second seal, I heard the, the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So this is the second seal, and it's a red horse. Now, what do we think of when we think red? Yeah. I think of blood, but I also think commies, communists, mm -hmm. the reds, right? So could communism re re resurge? You know, communism is violent. That's what communism is, violent overthrow of existing government, revolution. Um, this is violent. <laughs> I don't know, is that violent? Uh, it, it, it makes me wonder, you know, what these colors mean because they have meanings. But it says that uh, power was given unto him to take peace from the earth. So this one represents war. Somebody is going to declare war. Now, is this a separate rider? Could it be? Yeah. Um, some people, they try to claim, so throughout history, this guy is, I don't know, Charlemagne, and this guy is, I mean, they try to look at it like that. I think this is still future after the rapture. And it says there that he should take peace from the earth. Well, this sounds a lot like 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. Let's turn over real quick, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 3. Because there'll be a time when they cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, And when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So the Antichrist is going to take over through peace. But he's going to be the least peaceful person that ever lived. He's going to want war. The United Nations always talks about peace and security. You ever heard of their Peace and Security Council and all this stuff? That's interesting. Peace and safety, peace and security sounds the same. So that, again, makes me think, this guy, whoever he is, he's going to take over and he's going to be the head of the United Nations. Now, a great sword was given him. When Obama became president, did you know Malaysia gave him a sword? That's weird. When uh, Trump became president, Saudi Arabia gave him a sword? I just, I, when I read that, the great sword was given, I'm like, well, who's, who's giving out swords and who's receiving them? 
and it's the presidents of America, people have been giving them swords. That's weird. So God, can He use America in the last days perhaps? Some people say Obama's the Antichrist. Other people say Trump's the Antichrist. Well, whoever it is, He takes over by conquest. Okay? We haven't seen that yet, unless you want to say political conquest perhaps. But uh, th those would be some pretty good candidates, wouldn't they? As far as I know, because somebody gave them a sword. But then again, it could be a future event, they're giving a sword. Uh, I still believe all this takes place after, after the rapture. But it's interesting, in our day, we're seeing that political heads of governments, they give as gifts swords. And who is it that gives these swords? It's usually those from Islam. Have you ever been to Saudi Arabia? Seen those Arabs walking around with their swords on their sides? They still do beheadings in places like that, which is scary, which is scary. So that's the second, and uh, that's interesting. So go back to Revelation chapter 6. Verse 4, And there went another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. Now that's weird. They should kill one another. I mean, in war, one group kills the other group. But this makes it sound like individuals are killing each other. Could you imagine? Uh, what's the best way to depopulate? Well, an EMP pulse, a famine, a lack of food, have it to where there's no food in the grocery stores, your neighbor's coming over to steal your food and you have to defend yourself or he's going to do something to you to take it. <laughs> I mean, if, you, if I was the devil, I wouldn't waste a lot of time. I'd just do something like that and then let everybody kill each other off and laugh at them. And I think that's the plan of the devil, don't you? And that's sad, but we, we will see here that that is what the devil wants. He wants people dead. And it says, And there was given unto him a great sword. Now verse 5, And when... He had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, come and see. Now would this correspond with the third one in order of when we're given? That would be the one that's man, the face of a man. He said, come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. So here's the black horse. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So here we have famine and economic collapse. Now a penny, okay, that is actually denarius in the Greek language. And um, it's about the size of a dime. In the old days, a day's wage, you would get a denarius, a silver denarius. That was a whole day's wage. And so you would get one of those and that's what you'd go and you'd buy everything with. And that was enough money, a day's wage, to buy a whole lot of bread, not just one. So imagine how bad it gets that your whole paycheck for one whole day is enough to just buy some bread. That's going to be how awful that is. How much do people make in one day? $100, $200? I, I honestly don't know. But imagine if you're working all day and then all you can do is go buy the bread and eat some bread. That sounds like a horrible economic collapse. And so on this one, this is going to be a collapse. So these are the things that are going to be happening after the rapture. Somebody's going to come in through conquest, take over, probably part of the world. But then he's going to get the rest of the world into a big war. And there's going to be a horrible economic collapse and famine. And a lot of people are going to die. That's sad. That's sad. But that's what's going to happen. Now, we could see that happening today almost. <laughs> and we see those things coming. But I believe this is still future. This is still after the rapture, because that's when the apocalypse starts taking place, after the rapture. Now, penny is used twice here. And in uh, England, they used a penny, and that was a day's wage. And so imagine a day's wage to buy and, and some bread. And in those days, it was daily bread. If you said, give us this day our daily bread, you would buy um, the things and, and make bread daily. And that's actually so healthy for you, I don't have time to get into that. So a day's wage for bread. Now, it says then, see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. When I see oil, you know what my first thought is? Well, like petroleum. <laughs> but it's actually, no, it's talking about olive oil. But I believe God gave us the King James Bible in such a way that it, it can have several applications. And what are they all about today? Oh, don't hurt the price of oil because, you know, we want our gas prices to go up. That's interesting. But also olive oil. And uh, olive oil or other kind of oils for cooking. Again, it ties into an economic collapse with a famine, cooking oil, and the wine. People want their wine, don't they? God have that wine. Well, in the old days, they drank wine. You know why they drank wine? Because so many 
people lived in an area that when they pooped, it, oftentimes it went into the creek. You couldn't go to a creek and drink out of the creek or you'd get sick because, you know, sewers ran into that. So what would you need to do? Well, you would take the water and then you would take some fermented alcohol and mix a little bit in the water and then whatever was bad in there, that killed it. So that's why people would drink wine. It was not for uh, getting drunk as much as it was keeping me from getting sick. And remember Paul says, a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. So it was almost like a medicine. Um, here in America, I remember Benjamin Franklin, he would go to taverns and in the taverns they would serve grog or they would serve beer. And he said he'd get so upset because you couldn't get drunk on the beer in the taverns because they watered it down so much. <laughs> and so he wanted to go there and get drunk, but guess what? No. But that's what it was for. So hurt not the oil or the wine. But then verse 7, And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast saying, Come and see. Now would that fourth beast um, apply to the next one, which would be the eagle? And the fourth beast is a pale horse, which is a green color. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. So here we have the fourth beast, and it's green. Now, the Bible translates it pale, the King James Bible. I don't have a problem with that. People go, no, new versions need to say green. No, they don't. If you're sick, what do you say? Oh, you look pale. You kind of look a little green, don't you? <laughs> That's when um, somebody's oh, getting sick. Oh, you're turning green. So there's no problem there. You just need to look and, and see what it's saying. A pale horse is a green horse. But this is the only one in which they actually give the name of the writer. And the writer's name is Death. What a horrible name. Hello, I'm Death. Ha! Ah, you'd be running away if some guy was named Death, wouldn't you? But his name was Death. And hell followed him or followed with him. So this is a death with a capital D. This is death personified. Who would this be? Well, I looked up death with a capital D and it only shows up three times in the King James Bible. Proverbs 18, 21, and then here in Revelation 6, 8, but also 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So let's go there real quick because this proves a pre-tribulation rapture again. Amen? <laughs> Can't do enough of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54. People say, we're going through the tribulation. We're going through the tribulation. Nope, this shows we can't. Because look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 54. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Capital D. Death is swallowed up in victory. So we get the victory over death when we go up at the rapture. So how is death going to find us? in the sense that we're going through the tribulation and die in that time. We're out before that time. So that has to be future. And it has to be that we have the victory over death through Christ at the rapture. Then those people are left behind. Sadly, a lot of them are going to die. Could this be the angel of death? The destroyer he's called in Exodus 12, 23. Who would that be? That would be Satan. Remember in the book of Exodus how the destroyer would come house to house and kill all those that didn't have the blood, the Passover. I looked up destroyer in the King James Bible just for fun and it showed up 11 times. 11 is the number of judgment. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So here it is. Now people today want to say that we're already in this. There are people today that say we're already going through this. And I guess what, the war in Iraq was the conquest or something? I guess the Arab Spring or something was their conquest? And then war, man, we haven't seen a war. That's not World War III yet. They're just a bunch of skirmishes all over. And have we seen a global economic collapse and famine? No. But this one also has to do with the plague. And they say, well, there's your you know, COVID right there. And there's all these people dying from... Um, I think that's a pretty weak argument. I don't see it like this yet. But people try to apply this to today, and I think they need to be careful. Because where's the rapture? That leaves out the rapture. All right, so back to Revelation chapter 6. And uh, it says, And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill. The fourth part of the earth. So if there's nine billion people in the world, then that's one-fourth of the population. What would that be? It would be 2.25 billion dead. Have we seen 2.25 billion people die yet? Not even close. 
We've seen a lot of folks die, but not that many. So we're not in this yet. We're not there yet, I don't believe. I believe this is future. But look what it says they're killed with. They're killed with a sword. Who uses a sword? Wouldn't they just use a gun? Does something happen to where the, the, this guy, when he takes over, he takes all the people's guns? All they have left is swords and knives? Because that's what their agenda is, take away all people's guns. And then over here, kill with a sword. Um, what a weird thing. You would think people would have guns and other things. But a sword with hunger. How do you kill somebody with hunger? Well, you keep them from getting food. And with death. Well, of course you kill people with death. <laughs> but is there a way to make someone die faster? I don't know, say maybe um, using some sort of Hitlerian way of, of, of killing people like they did. Remember when Hitler scientists would do bad tests on people and things? Ooh, maybe that's another way. And with the beast of the earth. Now look at that, with the beast of the earth. How did the beast of the earth kill people? It sounds like, and again, this has to be future tribulation, not before the rapture. It sounds like the world gets so bad, all the electricity's off, people are living out in the woods almost because everything is destroyed and they got to watch out for the lions and the tigers and the bears. Oh my. And they got to worry about the coyotes and the sharks and the wolves and things like that. And the animals begin to kill people. Even the animals become wicked, I guess. <laughs> and maybe they're got devils in them. You know, and remember in the Bible when they went into pigs and stuff like that? But what a horrible time to live where even the animals are after you. Now, if that's not an argument for a gun, I don't know what is. If you live in Alaska, you have to have a gun. I don't know anybody in Alaska that I've visited that, that didn't have a gun because there's so many animals out there, especially grizzly bears, that if you happen on them, you're dead. You're a snack for him unless you've got a, what, 450 or something. I don't know what they have. They've got big ones over there. It's like kind of when you shoot, you're like your hand hurts for a week. But uh, what a thing. A lot of people, they live in the cities and they don't think about what it's like to live in nature. There are animals that can and will kill you, and you need to be able to defend yourself from that. So I just thought that was interesting, the beast of the earth. Even the animals will be against man. Now, verse um, 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, so there's all the four seals, that's all future, that's something that a person who misses the rapture has to look forward to. <laughs> I feel sorry for them that missed the rapture. But then in verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. All right, now who are these? Well, your people that say, well, this is all throughout history. This isn't after the rapture. This is all. Those are all the people that died for Jesus, like under the Inquisition and things like that. These are true Christians that died. And no, the context tells us when this takes place and when they were slain. And it has to be after the rapture. These are tribulation saints who died in the tribulation. Look at what it says. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell in the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that, that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. What is this little season? When we get saved, we go to heaven as soon as we die, and we're given a white robe. Who are these people that are up there and they're waiting for a white robe? And how do they get there? And why were they slain? Well, do you remember the mark of the beast? What does the Bible say? Well, let's, uh, I got ahead of myself here. Um, I'll back up here in a second. But the mark of the beast, remember, um, people are beheaded if they don't take the mark of the beast. That's who this sounds like. Now, I'll get back to that here in a minute. But let's go back real quick to the death and hell. Um, go to verse 8 again. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that set on him was death, and hell followed with him. All right? The Bible teaches a place called hell. And in many churches today, there's a lot of what we'd call liberals who say, well, I don't believe in a literal burning hell. You remember when the famous Billy Graham said that? I can't believe that. A lot of people, Billy Graham's the greatest evangelist that ever lived. And yet, when he got to the end of his life, was it on Larry King or something? I think he was, giving, he was giving an interview and he says, well, I no longer believe in a burning literal hell. Okay, apostate. I mean, I mean what, what other confession is that? So is there a place called hell? After you die without Jesus, that's where the Bible teaches that a person goes. And we don't want that. That's why we try to preach the gospel. Get saved. Go at the rapture so you don't have to go through hell on earth and then go through hell 
down below. But in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 18, it talks about when she died, and it says her soul was in departing. So every person has within them a soul. And we've looked at that, body, soul, and spirit. And when a person dies, their soul leaves their body. If they're saved, it goes to heaven. If they're not, it goes to hell. So there is a place called hell. And uh, Psalms 9, 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations that forget God. Now let's turn at Luke chapter 16. Here's a guy in hell. Now I don't like talking about hell. It's an awful place. But I talk about it not because I want people to go there. I don't. I want to warn people and tell them how not to go there. And that's why the gospel is good news. Because the good news is you don't have to go there. You can get saved and go to heaven with Jesus. Amen? But in Luke chapter 16, verse 22 through 25, here's somebody who went there. And the Bible teaches a literal burning hell. Have you ever seen Estes Perkle's The Burning Hell? <laughs> that's an old video that came out in the 70s or 80s. Um, in verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in what? Torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. So here's a person that's down there in a place called hell. Is there a true place called hell? Where is it? Let's go to Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22. There are people today that claim to be Christians, claim to be pastors, claim to be evangelists, claim to be missionaries, and they don't believe in a place called hell. And they don't preach and warn people about it. And that's sad because that's what they're supposed to be doing is saying, hey, look what Jesus did for you so you don't have to go there. And they won't even tell you where it is. The Bible teaches that it's downstairs. Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So according to the Bible, hell is down. Now you look at uh, science, what does it teach? It refuses to use the word, doesn't it? Well, it's a mag uh, molten magna core and a, a, a hot uh, lava in the middle of the earth. Oh, you mean hell? No, 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 no. It's, it's just this really, really hot down there, and it's a magna. You mean it's hell? No, no, no. They don't want to use the words that the Bible use. They just want to believe that it exists, but they don't want to believe that, hey, have you ever thought about the afterlife? Job chapter 11 and verse 8, real quickly I'll read. It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? So there are many, many verses that talk about hell being down. We don't have time to go there, but uh, Psalms 55, 15, Psalms 86, 13, Proverbs, I believe it's 5, either 5, 3 or 5, 5. And it says that hell is below our feet. It's down and it exists. So the Bible teaches there's a place called hell and you don't have to go there. Jesus saves through his blood and you can be saved from hell. But if you miss the rapture, then you've got to either endure to the end or die as a martyr for Jesus. So back to Revelation chapter 6, what we're seeing here in verses 9 through 11 is people who missed the rapture who said, man, I, I should have gotten saved, but I didn't. And they say, but I, I want Jesus. And the world says, you take the mark and you reject Jesus. And they say, no, they're beheaded and they die as a martyr for Jesus. And that's them in heaven. So you can still go to heaven in the tribulation, but it's way different than today. Today it's by believing the gospel. Then it's either you endure to the end. Now good luck with that. How are you going to live seven years or even three and a half years if you can't buy or sell? Because the Bible says they can't buy or sell those that have the mark. Now let me go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 and let me show you this beheading. And who is it that does beheading in the world? There's one religion that still does that as a punishment. Islam. Islam. Hmm. So again, does that take us back to... Wondering about that. Did you see? Yeah, I think I showed you the flags of Islam and how they have these colors. So, interesting, is it not? Now, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded 
for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither received his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. And now also over there in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 18, it talks about the mark of the beast. And how you cannot buy or sell, save they that had the mark. And how they were slain, those that didn't take the mark of the beast. So when I go to Revelation chapter 6, and I see this fifth seal, and I see these souls, remember the soul leaves your body when you die, I see these souls in heaven, I go, that's tribulation saints. I mean, that's a no-brainer, right? That's who it sounds like. So now with that, let's read it again, verse 9 through um, 11. Revelation 6, 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Lord, we, we were killed for you. How come you're not judging them yet? Well, doesn't God's wrath get poured out in the tribulation? Yeah. And white robes were given to every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Okay, so wait a little longer. I don't know what, three and a half years maybe? And until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were. Okay, how were they killed? Beheaded. And then it says, uh, should be, uh, be, be fulfilled. So that to me looks like tribulation saints. I've had people try to say, no, this is the church age and people who got saved for Jesus. Reading the whole thing in context like we have, that sounds like that's got to be over here in the tribulation. Right? Are you all with me? Because that's somebody who died for Jesus. Because we got out. We're in chapter 4, the door open in heaven, we get out. So, Revelation chapter 6, and now let's go on to verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Hmm, the sun turning black and the moon turning blood. You ever heard of a blood red moon? Things like that. <clears throat> verse 13, And the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. What we're reading in this chapter is starting after the rapture and is going from here all the way to here. So there's no rapture in chapter 6. It's already taken place. This is all things taking place here. So watch what we read next. Verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That sounds like Jesus coming in. Armageddon. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? That's Armageddon. So here we have this sixth seal and it starts with an earthquake. Now, I wish we had time to go over and read the entire chapter of Matthew 24. So can I have you write that down and do that? Can I ask you to tonight read Matthew 24? Because everything we're seeing here is also in Matthew 24. The plagues, the false Christ coming, that would be the Antichrist. Uh, it, the earthquake is mentioned over there. It's all there. So it's all what Jesus said was coming for the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is what? The kingdom that Jesus was preaching, the kingdom message for Israel. So it's all lining up with Jesus and what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 24. But notice what it says here. Man, an earthquake. Now there's a lot of things in here about an earthquake. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 14 real quickly. And I've told you before and I taught you right that God is not done with Israel. So the final week of Daniel, Ezekiel 14... The final week of Daniel is for Israel, for God to go back to dealing with the Jews. So all that we're reading in chapter 6 has to be after the church is out and God's back dealing with the Jews again. So this earthquake thing sounds like it's got to be during the tribulation. And what's going to happen? Well, an interesting prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 21. Ezekiel 14, 21 through 24. For thus saith the Lord God... How much more when I shall send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem? Four judgments. Is that what the four horsemen are? Judgments from God? Four sore judgments upon Jerusalem. The sword. Well, there's a sword there. And the f famine. There's a the famine. And the noisome beast. Remember the, the beasts are going to kill people. 
and the pestilence to cut them off from it, man and beast. Yet behold, there shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings. And ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings. And ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. So there's four judgments coming, and it's for whom? It's so that God can deal with the nation of Israel. Now, He's dealing with all the nations too, but He's trying to prepare the Jews for Him coming back in the kingdom. So that's, I just thought that was interesting. Four judgments, and it sounds like at least three of them line up with the four. So is that a prophecy of this? Now, there's an earthquake coming, a huge earthquake. Go to Revelation chapter 16, and we see this earthquake. Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. Revelation 16, 17. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts. What's the great city? Jerusalem. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. That is some earthquake that it brings down whole mountains and buries islands. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Doesn't that sound like them going underground and, you know, hiding from it and calling the mountains to the rocks to fall on them and things like that? So this all ties together. Now, I don't have a lot more, but I want to get some Old Testament verses here. So let's go to Joel chapter 2. We read in Revelation 6 about the sun turning to dark and the moon turning to blood. So let's go to Joel. Let's see, Daniel and then Hosea. And then Joel. Joel chapter 2, verse 30 through 32. Joel 2, 30. Joel chapter 2, verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord in the Old Testament is always a day of gloom. It's always terrible. It's always dreadful. Because it's when Jesus comes back at Armageddon and destroys His enemies. And it says in verse 32, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So this is all happening for God to judge the evil and to save Israel. Amen? Now, back in uh, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 13, it talks about the falling of the stars. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth. Now, I'm not a big fan of Stephen King. But I remember reading some of his books when I was younger. One was called The Stand. It was about this Antichrist figure who showed up and took over the world in a time of bad things happening. He, he wrote another book, I can't remember the name of it, about a dome over the earth and the stars were falling. That was a, a TV show that came out after that. I forget. Do you remember what that was called, Laura? The Dome, I think it was called, or something like that. It's, it's so weird. I don't like Stephen King, but it's almost like he read the Bible, and he's like, I'll just copy a lot of what it said. And a lot of the stuff that you read sounds like things that take place during this time. Was he led by the Lord to write that, or could possibly he just make it up? Or maybe is there some sort of spirit influencing what he writes? It's just so weird how it just seems... Why would he write a book about stars falling from heaven? And because of that, it, it changes everyone's life and things like that. But here we see stars falling from heaven. Well, stars are angels. Is this uh, Satan again getting angels to fall with him from heaven? It could be. It could be. But uh, verse 14, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. So we see what? We see Armageddon here. So we see chapter 6 telling us about 
what's going to take place after the rapture. And it's starting here and it's going through this whole thing and it's ending with this right here. Jesus coming back to rule. For a thousand years he's going to rule. So when we see that, let's look at some more stuff. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 34. I just want to close with a couple Old Testament verses. A lot of people don't read their Old Testament, so they're missing out. And a lot of what we read in Revelation, I've told you, is found already back in the Old Testament, if we'll just read it. Isaiah chapter 34, verse 1 through 8. See if you don't see what we've just been reading about taking place at Armageddon, taking place here in this passage already prophesied about. This is Armageddon. Okay? Look what it says. Isaiah 34, 1 through 8. Come near ye nations to hear and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. Well, we're reading about something taking place in the world, a world war, a lot of people in the world dying. So God is dealing with the nations. Verse 2, For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and His fury upon all their armies. He shall utterly destroy them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. That's the battle of Armageddon. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved. We just read that. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth from the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. We just read that. Isn't that amazing? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. It's already back here in the book of Isaiah. And then we're getting it again in the New Testament. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozrah and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them. <laughs> We've been reading about horse and a rider. Well, a lot of people think of a unicorn as a horse with a little thing on it. And maybe in heaven there are unicorns and our horses that we ride with Jesus have a little horn on it. I don't know. But I find that interesting. And the bullocks with the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. What an amazing statement for the controversy of Zion. What does the world do today? They say it's a great controversy over there. We need to make peace in Israel. Lots of presidents come in. They say, I want to make peace between the Arabs and, and, the, and the Jews. And what do they always want the Jews to do? Give up their land. And God says, no, that's, that's, that belongs to them. That's my land. Isn't that interesting? And so it's the great controversy over there. Now let's go to Zephaniah. If you can find Zephaniah, that's one of those books. Let's go to Zephaniah chapter 1. I just want to read a couple more verses that tie all this together. We believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. And we are premillennialists, And we're right. Because that's what the Bible teaches. And you wouldn't know that unless you'd read your Old Testament along with the New Testament. Right? Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. Zephaniah comes after Habakkuk, <laughs> which comes after Nahum, which comes after Micah, which, okay. If you can find Jonah, then you're close, okay? All right, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man, shall cry there bitterly. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess. Why would it be dark? The sun turned to black. A day of clouds and thick darkness. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men, and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord, and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Neither shall their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy, for he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Good riddance to the United Nations and to the Antichrist and to the evil ones who want to rule the world. Now we're here. Let's read verse 7 and, and all the way down to verse 9 too. Verse 7, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice, he hath bid his guests. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such as are clothed with strange apparel. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be 
the noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howling from the second and a great crashing from the hills. Sounds like the earthquake. It's all there, what we've already read. Um, let's see. Go over to Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13. While you're going over there, didn't we just read in Revelation something about the princes? Well, here we just read about the princes. The people who are in charge of governments in this world are not friends with Jesus Christ. Did you know that? Many of them are Luciferians and are working for the devil to bring in his one world government. So that's what the Bible teaches. But there it is, verse 15 in Revelation. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains... And yet we're reading back here that these are the ones that God's going to judge because they're not working on our behalf, are they? <laughs> I get phone calls, I get emails from people that say, I don't understand what my government's doing because everything they're doing is not for us, the people. <laughs> it's for their own selfish gain. It's to bring in a one world agenda, agenda 21, agenda 30, all that kind of stuff. So Isaiah chapter 34, let's read, um, wait, 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 Isaiah 13, excuse me, Isaiah 13. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. So I'm tying all this together, and we're going to get this over again in the book of Revelation. It tells the same story over again. After the rapture, tribulation, and then Armageddon. We can see that over and over and over again. It's like he got four different visions of the same thing, and it's all after the rapture. Why is that amazing? That's the end of the Bible, or the end of the New Testament. Beginning of the New Testament, it's four separate retellings of the same thing. Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Four and four. So Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 6, Isaiah 13, 6, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in the pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed at one another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, it says, Let's see, I read verse 6. Well, I'll just keep reading. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay, lay the land desolate, and He shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. What a blessing that someday all these sinners that think they're getting away with something are going to have to pay for their sin. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in His goings forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. We just read that. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And it says, And it will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. And I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the gold wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place. There's your earthquake. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of His fierce anger. Now let's flip over to Isaiah 24 and I'll be done. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 21. 21 through 23, Isaiah 24. Well, let's, let's start in verse 19. That's even better. Isaiah 24, 19. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. There's the Lord destroying it so that He can reign over it in the Millennial Kingdom. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high. Huh, remember all these stars fell? Are those the fallen angels? And they get punished too? And it says, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Well, there's all your ten kings that are, I think all the different uh, presidents of the different countries in the world right now are all fighting to become one of the ten kings because they know what's coming. They know the Antichrist wants to take over. Verse 22, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Well, they go to hell, then after a thousand years they come out to be judged at the great white throne of judgment. And the moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and before His ancients gloriously. Oh, there's no millennial reign of Christ. God's done with the Jews. <laughs> Somebody doesn't know their Bible. Do you see why it's important to believe what we believe? Pre-millennial, pre-tribulation. Otherwise, you're one of those getting squashed. Um, Jesus is not going to appoint me to wrath, the Bible says. I'm not going through this. So we get out here so God can do what He's doing here. And so God allows this to happen on earth, kind of like 
a judgment, it seems like. But then he's got his other judgments too. He's got the seven trumpets and the seven vials and other things. But this are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And it's awful. And I wouldn't want to go through that for anything in the world. I'm glad I'm saved. But yet you've got people out there that claim to be Christians. And they say, oh, that's not true. No, we go through the tribulation. <laughs> well, you want to go through that? You want, I think they want to fight it. I think, oh, I'm going to fight the new world order. I'm, that's dumb. They're going to win for a while, and they're going to kill a fourth of the population. And you're going to go through all this bad stuff. You might even die of hunger. You want that, do you? And one of the ways to get to heaven is have your head cut off. You want to die as a martyr for Jesus? No thanks. Today is the day of salvation. Get saved today. Don't wait. Don't wait. So let's just go back real quick to Revelation chapter 6 and uh, read again the sixth seal. Verse 12 down to 17 and I'll be done. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood. Here's when Jesus is, is going to come back at Armageddon. And the stars of heaven fell into the earth even as a fig tree casteth her on timely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Sounds like those evil angels are being told, no, you've got to go down there. So God can pour out His wrath and destroy everybody all at once in one place. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men, remember I showed you all this in Isaiah and Ezekiel, it's all there. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. There's your underground bases. <laughs> a lot of these so-called elite, they claim they have underground bunkers. And that sounds like that's where they're going to go. But they won't be safe, will they? God's going to find them. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? The devil won't. Now, there's no time to go into the rest of it. That's why we can go in verse by verse, and I can't wait to get over there to Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 20. It tells what happens after, because when it, it's over, the battle of Armageddon, Jesus reigns for a thousand years here. But down here, the devil is put into a pit. And the Bible says that, that he gets to stay there for a thousand years and then come back out. And when the devil comes out at the end of that thousand years, God lets the devil deceive some people to follow him. And then this time, Jesus just says, it's enough. Boom, they all burn up. <laughs> and it's all over. Now we start a new heaven and a new earth. But that's when the great white throne of judgment is. And that's when they're judged and then cast into a lake of fire. So that's what the Bible teaches. I enjoyed doing it for you. I enjoyed having Laura cut out the little stencil for me to draw off these. I did the best I could. But uh, that's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And again, I believe that must be future after the rapture. But we're starting to see a glimpse of it today, huh? We could have an economic collapse in our country at any time. A war could break out at any time. There could be lots of plagues at any time. Conquest. So these things have all throughout history have happened but never on this scale. And that's what I'm saying. This has got to be after the rapture on a scale, like it says, an earthquake like the world's never seen. Economic collapse, a plague. Matter of fact, there's seven plagues of God, the Bible says. You think we went through some plagues and pestilence in the last couple years with all these different variants and stuff? Wait till God gives man plagues and all these kind of things. So God has been very gracious, has He not? Waiting how many years before He poured out His wrath upon the earth? God is a gracious God, and He's given you time to get saved if you need to get saved. But get saved now, because the rapture could be tomorrow. And you're left behind in this? Wow. I wouldn't want that for anybody. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank You for the opportunity to study this. Lord, I love studying Your Word, and I just love it, Lord, when You speak to us from it. And Lord, just going to the Old Testament and seeing these verses and how they line up, Lord, it's just incredible that we know that you wrote this book. We pray now that all the hearers would take heed to what was said, and Lord, that they would come to you. And we pray that you'd come soon and get what you deserve. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.